Right, we're uh, we're in a bit of a familiar place uh, to to ad- avid home brewed viewers. This is, of course, the spot. Uh, although a bit zoomed in, where we would film home brewed studio sessions, um, and that's because we're down at Damien Gerard Studios today. We're sitting here with Marshall Cullen, uh, the studio manager, been in and around the studio in its various forms for decades. Mm-hmm. Um, to tell us a little bit about this studio and everything that is behind it, because as we're about to find out, the history in this place is just remarkable. So, Marshall, welcome to Homebrew. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. And uh, I'm just so glad you guys love this space. And, you know, I was so pleased with what I've seen so far of the recordings we did here and the filming. They sound good. They look great. So, um, it's it's a great uh, a great point to get to with Damien Gerard because certainly uh, talking about the history when we began um, in 1982 I mean I wasn't involved in 85 but I walked into the the place in 85 and saw and it really started as two little rehearsal rooms down in Ultimo Uh, and then it grew to three rehearsal rooms then they put a demo studio in because in those days um, bands just had no way to record no one had iPhones cassettes were barely invented you know they were just coming along so eventually there was a thing called a four track cassette recorder that bands could record little basic songwriting things on but in the early 80s that wasn't even a thing so even for someone could write a song at home but then they're like okay well we've written the song we've got to record it so they'd ring up a demo studio and that's the thing that's kind of not around anymore because people can do it at home right on a computer so back then there was a lot more work for studios because you, know, you could start at a small level, which we, which we did, and the whole thing just grew organically. So bands would come in, they'd do their demo on our little eight-track tape machine that we had in those days. Um, and that's everyone, even major label bands had to do that. So we had people like the Divinals, uh, Spy vs. Spy, Hoodoo Gurus, The Church, Died Pretty, uh, even Barnsley at one point. So that whole group of uh, in excess too actually i must they came in and did uh, like a whole month in one of the rehearsal rooms with a with a producer to just to prepare for an album so it was that sort of thing we weren't necessarily doing the final product to start with we were doing the bit in between which has kind of gone away because people are either recording at home now to, to, for that part when they're writing the song they can actually quickly record it or they're just going to the main studio uh, doing everything there so we were sort of the in-between studio for a long time. Um, but the great thing about that was it was affordable and it was right there in the centre of Sydney and we just got to meet everyone and everyone found out about Damien Gerard's in those days from the from the top-level bands right down to all the little inner-city Sydney bands and plenty of bands even in, back in the day lived up here and they'd travel down from Gosford or even Newcastle because there weren't any sort of studios up on the coast in those days. Um, So yes, it grew from a rehearsal place, doing demos. I came in in 85. I'd been out on on doing live work from my early, or yeah, from around my mid-teens. I was lucky enough to, through a friend of the family's uh, Little River Band sound guy, um, sort of took me under his wing. And every time I got school holidays, I'd go over to Melbourne and and be their gaff, they called it a gaffer boy. So I'd run around theatres gaffering down cables and I learnt sound that way because there weren't the other big differences. There's no such thing as an audio course or a sound school or JMCs and AIMS and SAEs, nothing like that. You just learnt on the job. So you're either out on the live learning sound or you're in a studio learning sound. And I started in, coming from Tasmania, there was no recording studios there. So I started out live and... Um, by 1985, you know, I was mixing lots of bands um, in Sydney. Um, trying to think of some of them. Noiseworks, for example, I was working with them when they first started. Uh, and But I'd met them through the studio. Um, so I had a vision of wanting to improve the studio so it could get to the level of doing final product. So that, you know, you could come to Damien Gerard and record and the thing could get released in those days on vinyl or on CDs came along, you know, towards the end of the 80s, I guess. Um, and we achieved that by about the early 90s. And you know, we bought a 24-track tape machine, a better console, uh, some better mics, and we were able to do that. 
but still at a, a I guess a mid a mid level, a very indie sort of level. And then the next thing that happened was um, the Ultimo building where we started. The landlord demolition clause, classic Sydney scenario, happened at so many studios in Sydney, block of apartments, Meriton bought, buys the building. So we're like, oh, what are we going to do? So uh, luckily Festival Studios, which was a, a big major studio and a record label and everything back in the day, and Mushroom were partners with it, Gadinsky, lots of you know, the upper levels of the industry. They had this great building in Piedmont with a fantastic studio. Uh, Silverchair did that Greatest View album there and oh, so many other famous acts there. Midnight Oil did a record there. So they said, you guys are, you know, so important to the developing, you know, new bands coming through and they can come to your place for, you know, an affordable price and um, you, you can't just disappear. So they let us come into their studio and they set up a, a, a room for us. So we were based there for about two or three years, which was great because all my engineers got to work, you know, on the oils and on the, the chair sessions. And um, we worked with uh, Gary Beers from In Excess because uh, he had to, he just, on a separate project where he had to transfer, you know, a hundred old archive tapes of, of In Excess for whatever reason to preserve them. So that was our job. So we had our little room and we'd be sitting there for six months merely transferring. So strange things like that that just kept us alive. So then the next big event, I guess, was um, moving up here. Uh, and that came about, as I was saying before, um, the same thing again, demolition clause came along and um, we tried to get in early there. So I, I was at least didn't get caught out the way I had before and was looking around and then through various contacts found out about this building and Jason Stenning, the guy that owns it, and uh, that he already had some, some great mics and guitars and a collection of his own. And we got together and, and basically did a deal and he became a major partner in the studio and we ended up here. And I've lived on the coast for over yeah, about 20 years now, so it was perfect for me as well. Um, you know, back, the history of the acts that we've had through is like, I mean, Belmont, even... You know, Ultimo was those early 80s bands I mentioned that everyone's heard of, that a lot of them are still going. Hoodoo Gurus was another big band still going. And, I mean, I still work for them as a live guy. But then Bell Main had, um, you know, Rob Hurst from the Oils did a solo record in there. The Vines did a lot of their recordings in there. Um, the band, uh, Radio Birdman, New Christ, Rose Tattoo, you know, the list, sort of this endless list. I lose track myself of <laughs> who's been there. It's awesome just to have a space like this on the coast now. You said you moved up in 2019. Yeah. You know, it feels like now, like now we are in 2023, it's a real exciting time for mm. the local music scene here on the coast and Damien Gerard's having quite a large part in helping people, you know, achieve, you know, their dream of recording a single or dropping an album or just being able to, you know, being a producer or not, or an engineer, like you're providing those opportunities for people who are just into music on the coast. That's right. We've had, um, even recently, we've had a couple of um, young work experience people through and they, you know, had a really valuable time and I've had some great, pardon me, uh, feedback from them on, on what they learnt and everything. Um, and um, the same, you know, guys like Murray, who uh, he, he actually did the course at the Grove and then... Um, found us you know soon after that and uh, he's worked his way up through through COVID he's done a lot of extra training with us on uh, everything other than Pro Tools which was the main thing he'd learnt and uh, now he's a, he's a fully fledged engineer here he does a lot of the sessions completely solo by himself you know doesn't he's not just an assistant anymore but then the great thing is when we get someone like Winterbourne in here with a, a more senior engineer like uh, Jackson Murray knows everything here so intimately and every every patch and where this feeds to that and that feeds to that. So he's always still integral on those sessions. Uh, and then he's also still learning more from, from the, the senior guy, which is how it's always, mm. always been. So it's just great that that tradition can continue on as well. 
and your role here is the you're the studio manager so you're not necessarily hands-on with the production or the engineering or anything like that but you you'd said you did a lot of live stuff as well you still do live stuff yep. with the Huda Gurus I'll be mixing them at the entrance in about a week <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we just did a show at Manly Barracks a couple of weeks ago and we did a show for Elbow um, on Thursday night last week at the factory um, but yeah I'm pretty much the admin guy you know I'm the one you call for bookings and quotes and everything like that um, but certainly you know with my I've, I've produced plenty of records with my background so if it's the right thing that comes along and you know I'm getting on really well with the artist you know I, I, I love jumping in there and throwing my two cents worth at it I'm not necessarily on the board but um, every now and then I am especially if I've got a young guy like Murray on the computer <laughs> <laughs> I'll sit there and push the photos around but um, I sometimes get involved with a lot of pre-production for people too you know they'll send me their rough songs even off an iPhone and I can help them arrange them and um, pick you know a lot of artists they might have 20 songs and they want to make a, an album and as the artist you're so close to your own music it's often really hard for them to go well I've got these 20 songs but I know I only really need 10 for an album and I've just got no idea I love them all they're my songs so they need another set of ears and with what I've done my whole life you know not not only working in music but you know I've got a massive vinyl collection I've been listening to music all my life and analyzing it and I used to write out arrangements of songs when I was you know 13 years old because by the of the Beatles or whoever I was just fascinated by oh, the verse the chorus and, and then what's that what what do you call that other bit that's not a verse or a chorus and that must be a bridge I've read about bridge, you know because <laughs> you again there was no way to train in those days mm -hmm. you couldn't go and do a songwriting course you had to learn it so I certainly really enjoy getting involved with helping people arrange their songs or pick all right in, to my ears these are the best half a dozen songs you've got you know that are put your best foot forward like record these six and then you know maybe the others need some more work but these are the six that are, I think are ready to go and we can maybe tweak the arrangements a little bit I've done that for quite a, quite a few does that come back to being a I guess more or less a demo studio in the earlier days do you think I think definitely because certainly when well, when see when it start when I first got involved in 85 it was because they needed the the, the prior owners who by the way the name comes from because it was Luke Damien Everingham and Adam Gerard Everingham. So that's where the Damien Gerard comes from. And Luke's still a sound dude. He does like installations and things in, in Sydney PA um, in pubs and stuff like that. He's still involved. Not sure what Adam's doing, but but they weren't they weren't actual studio engineers. I was a live engineer and they were like, you know, um, you could look after all the rehearsal. So I made all the first thing I did was make all the rehearsal PA sound good. So straight away. <laughs> that's a big help so more bands are like wow what's happened suddenly you can hear the vocal because that was my forte you yeah know? so then i was like yeah i really want to get into recording so i'd sit there in the little demo studio and just try and work it out you know and i remember sitting there one day till like three o'clock in the morning just to try to work out what well, this is going there and that's going there and I'll plug this in or why is it not working and because again there was no courses or anything you really had to train on the job so i was the actual recording engineer for probably the first five years from 1985 to 90 so i got to do all the i did all the demos for the gurus for uh, mars needs guitars and blow your cool some divinals demos i remember doing i can't remember what record it was for did the spy or pretty much all the spy versus spy demos so you know and and noise works which were called something else the change they were called before they were called noise works so i did all the demos for them that actually got them the deal with CBS and then because I was kind of integral with a lot of the 80s was a lot about getting these different sounds too through processing so I'd go I went up to 301 and um, and Rhino and got to sit in on those sessions with Marco Pitts producing and learnt so much from that as well um, and it was just the best way to meet people too in the, in the in the industry because not only would you meet the band You'd meet the producer, you'd meet like the A and R dudes would be in there as well, because they were part of the creation of those songs in the early stages to make sure that all oh, right, there's the three singles, there's this and you know, I remember working with um Kevin Shirley, you know, who he was one of our engineers. He we were he, the first year he came to after he left South Africa. And he's of course his his nickname now is Caveman. So he got his big break, he mixed Frog Stomp with Silverchair, right? and then went 
on the back of that, ended up living in America for years. He's only really just moved home in the last few years. He's in Manly now. But, you know, he went on to work with Aerosmith and Metallica and all of those big, you know, huge rock acts. Um, became a massively famous international engineer. But I'll never forget him engineering um, Ammonia, doing their demos for the album. Um, and they've broken up now. But they listen back to the album and the band are going, oh, we've done, you know, great, we've finished it. And, and Kev says, no, you need a song about drugs. You've got to write a song about drugs or you're not, you're not going to get on Triple J. And it was just classic producer move. And they're like, oh, you know, typical music. Like, what are you, he's like, just come on, let's write a song about drugs, let's do it. And they sat there, 20 minutes later, they had a song about drugs, go in, put it down. That was the song that got on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> that's what broke them, you know? He knew what he was talking about. He knew what he was talking about. It rings through with with this place and yourself as well that 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 history and that knowledge that you've attained through a lifetime, and then the history that is within these walls, whether it's instruments, that's kind of goes into everything when it comes to producing a song. It's one thing to have it, but to have that history. So when artists come through, like where do you begin with that? Like they come in, uh, they have the vision, and then you're just applying this wealth of knowledge yeah. to it, uh, instrumentation and everything like that. How would it look for a, a band when they're just rolling through here, um, you know, bog stock? Sure. Um, well, a lot of it depends, you know, where they're at with the songs. Um, it's a big help if they're a, lo- if they're a, w- a working live band because that means they've been out, you know, playing their set of songs to punters and <clears throat> the best feedback in the world is, is, you know, the dance floor or if you like the front line. And when you play a song and everyone turns around and goes and sits down, that's my, maybe not your best song. And if you play the next song and they're all like excited and they come running up the front and start dancing, it's like, oh, <laughs> maybe that's our best song. And that's, that's, so that's, that's a great thing about life. So when we have a band in here that's got that live experience, it's actually a lot easier to work with the songs because they're already to a certain point where the band have worked it out a little bit themselves because they've seen, they've had that direct feedback from their fans. Um, but if you take a step back to a, to a younger act that maybe they're, they're doing their first ever recording, like we, we did a band for, um, for Youth Rock, the winner of the Youth Rock Prize um, called Astrovan, I think they were called from Sydney, which Murray engineered. And he, he was a lot more involved talking to them first about, um, you know, what do you, what do you guys want to sound like? And they might have had some references of, oh, we, we really love, you know, Spacey Jane, for example, or that's probably not perfect for them, but you know, <laughs> they'd have some reference bands that then he'd be familiar with. Oh, okay, so you know you, you you're into you want the distorted guitar or the or, or the Fender sounding amp rather than the Marshall sounding amp. Um, so it's matching the band's vision, like you say, to what we have available here. That's going to help sonically achieve it because a lot of what as well apart from writing the song the band are going to have this sonic kind of idea in their head of oh you know these are the bands we love that we grew up with we want to sound a bit like that but obviously they still want to be their own thing but there's certain you know if you get take a fender guitar and plug it into a vox amplifier it's that jingly jangly indie pop kind of guitar sound if you take a gibson and plug it into a marshall that's Ang- Angus Young, ACDC, straight away. So there's certain things like that that are sort of classic sounds, you know. And once, and the same with drums, you know. There's certain drums that, you know, um, like an old Ludwig like that is the more 60s sounding or perfect for blues or country. Um, but if it's something more rock, a couple of those black kits in there, they're, they've got more attack and they have that more power sort of rock sound. And I guess that's where, you know, someone like yourself or just someone who's working as a producer or an engineer will have that knowledge and they'll be able to pass it on to a band coming yeah. through. Yeah, that's one of the big differences to a band just rocking up to a little studio or doing it themselves in a rehearsal room. And they've got all their own gear and that's probably perfectly good, but it's they can't sort of um, change it from song to song because if you, especially if you're making an album, which is... <clears throat> that's the best experience for a band, you know, because they're getting to do not just one song, but they're getting to stay for a week or so. Star Crazy uh, from Sydney, they've, they're coming up to do their second album and they've booked eight days, you know. And in that eight days, they'll do things like they'll change the snare drum around. So, oh, this song's a more up-tempo, kind of happy 
happy songs. So you might use a, a more tuned up, brighter kind of snare drum. So it's a bit more snappy. Uh, but then there might be a more somber kind of ballady song and you might need a big deeper sort of snare and that and that's just the drums so they'll come to a studio like this because all of those things are available yeah i'd be interested also in, in noting what what differences over the years i mean you've been doing this since the 80s you've watched how, how have you watched it evolve in terms of the bands that come through what they want out of their music the kind of music that is now being made what are your kind of reflections on all of that it's been um it's just incredibly cyclic um so certainly in the 80s there was this whole move to everything had to sound really processed you know it's it, it the early 80s it was more just a normal sort of pub rock sound i guess and then it became that big <coughs> sound on the snare drum you hear a lot of 80, like in excess or a classic example of that and that sound and the phil collins thing on the drums the big heavy reverb they call it gated reverb that became like i guess the sound of the 80s um but very cyclic like you hear a lot of that music now and you go oh that's an eight that's an 80s 80s band you know there it is um and now i think the thing that's come along is that that the auto-tune sound on the vocal so it's the vocal sounds a bit robotic in keyboardy in in pop but um, so the, the biggest game changer of all has been digital because it it allowed um Tape, mach tape machines are amazing things, but obviously, you know, it's, it's limited. It's 24 tracks. And you can play around and, you know, we were having to do things like your backing vocal track because the backing vocals might only happen in the chorus. So in between, you'd fit in some guitar sounds in the verses on the same track. But now with Pro Tools uh, or Logic, it's, it's kind of unlimited. So you, you, people's imaginations have expanded with that, with like all these different sounds that are possible. Um, and there's a good side to that because you can make all these incredible, you know, sonic visions if you like. But the bad side of it is, it it it's um there's just so many options, especially when you get to digital drums and digital sounds in a computer. There's literally you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of. So you might sit there punching through you know 500 snare drums. You know, <laughs> it's like two hours later, it was like I can't even remember what the first one. Yeah, can't remember which one actually liked yeah. first. Yeah. So there's good and bad. You know, with 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 that, it's just um, it's sort of sometimes the limits of technology back in the day. I think in some ways created you know more correct. More people had to use their imagination. In a, in a different way to really work within the limits and some really amazing music happened because of that. Um, things like, you know, the Velvet Underground could barely play their instruments. So they, I think Lou Reed famously just tuned every string on his guitar to the same note, but it made this really unusual fat guitar sound and that became like a signature sound. You know, nowadays you could do all that electronically and it'd be a completely different thing. And, and things like um, the Beatles are famous for all those um, backwards sounds. Some of the intros to songs would be George's solo backwards. That In the old days, that was, you know, a day's work because you'd have to flip the tapes <laughs> over and run them backwards and work out, well, it used to be, was on track three. That means it's now on track 17 or is it 18? And it was, it was, you know, the band would literally go home for a day. They'd go, okay, we, we want to reverse the guitar on those two now songs. Now you just highlight it <laughs> okay, in Pro Tools. See you tomorrow. Reverse. Now it's just like <laughs> one plug-in. Yeah. Which, their name. Yeah, which is kind of like, it's sort of, that's too easy, you know. It was, um, well, it, maybe that's why we're seeing a bit of a resurgence in analogue equipment. That's exactly what I was coming we're, to. we're yes. seeing a lot yes. of like modern musicians using equipment from the 70s and they're recording on that they're using that to to produce and release their music not they release are, it's still done digitally via spotify but records as well vinyl records making a resurgence at yep. the same time yep you can really tell i think from the from the fact of vinyl coming back that um not only the listeners are wanting that experience the bands are wanting the experience of recording the way that that golden age in the 60s and 70s really so and that's what what we love too so that's why we've got the vintage mics and the vintage equipment as well so they can certainly come and have that experience um there's a band from sydney uh alpha goose I think they might have even changed the name by now but they had a producer that was used to be a 301 studio manager so he's in his late 60s now but all he knew was tape and ssls and classic mics and 
they came and they spent a whole day just going through every single drum in the building to work out, okay, well, we, this, we'll use this for the kick drum. And he'd just listen to everything really carefully. Okay, that's the kick drum. And, okay, you know, and a day later they worked, they'd, okay, that's the drum kit. And that was day one. You know? <laughs> All right. And then it was like, okay, what mics are we going to put on it? Because that was the old, that's how you did it in the old days. Um, and I think those limitations back, like I was saying, in the 60s and 70s, it did make, for some really amazing music. This, I mean, the songs, the, the musicians and the songwriting had to be great anyway to get through the major label kind of gatekeeper system because they were the only people that could could afford to record if it was being funded by... I mean, studios were probably earning more money in those days than they are now because they, there was no competition. And a tape machine in the old days cost $100,000. A console cost $200,000. So... Studios still cost a lot of money to set up, and they charged accordingly because there wasn't they weren't competing with anything else. So a band would have to pretty much have a deal with you know someone with pretty deep pockets to be able to make a record, and it's that's good and bad as well. I mean, it's fantastic now that there's the access and someone can can record at home literally and break through, um, and. Um, there's also the other side of that where there's so much music that can be recorded and almost released on an, you know, via an iPad and you go to TuneCore or CD Baby and there it is on Spotify, but it's, it's little better than a demo. So it tends to, I think that can tend to devalue all the new music because it's so much of it hasn't really been, you know, worked on. You know, the, the, that demo, it might have the promise of a really good song, but they've released it so early in that stage of a song's development you know there's been no no one else's ears on it for example back in the day you know a and r guys were real song people you know like herb albert and his business partner they started a and m records you know herb albert was a musician himself so then when they signed you know carly simon and all these classics, Carol King, these classic, you know, 70s songwriters, they knew songs, they knew music, they knew what, what was going to work and then they could help to nurture the artists because they're coming from the same place. Now, most of the the big companies are, are run, you know, there's lawyers and accountants and it's, it's more the admin people running it. It's not so much the creative people running it. Um, so that's changed things a bit, I think, too. And something that we we discussed when we were here recording the studio sessions was the lack of commercial radio, I guess, supporting Australian music. And it's not just, you know, I guess something that, you know, we're obviously hyper fixated on local music and also music that sort of fits around that with a bit of a Triple J sound. But it's it's beyond that because, like, the you know, you look at, you know, Silverchair, just sort of that whole era of musicians that came through everyone knew who they were because they played on commercial radio as well as on Triple J. You look at the Horace 100s mm -hmm. of that era, the bands who were also popular on commercial were also being played on Triple J and therefore well-known in every household where you fast forward for today, Spacey Jane, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. should be played on just about any commercial station because they fit both your Rocky and your more poppy stations. Yep. But you could probably knock on half the households in Australia and they go, who? Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make to me. sense. I think um, just this week, because you know, pardon me, things are leading up to the Arias. I think Noise Eleven have put out an article, and they've listed like twenty songs by you know prominent you know major label Australian artists that that aren't actually getting played on commercial radio, and they're like you know what's what's going on. Um, I think there's just so many factors involved. Um, I was part of the Music Managers Forum back in the two th early 2000s and we were fighting for the quotas, trying to have the quota of Australian music. But we, even within, you know, say, say they say it's 20%, it's still voluntary, it's not legislated. And it's also certain stations can play, you know, old heritage classic hits and f fulfil their Aussie quota by playing, you know, Normie Row or something like that if they want to. Um, so that's a... It can, complex. It's not. It's not about new music necessarily. Um, then I think the other thing that's happened is, you know, the major labels are still a very powerful force. You know, they're they're the money and the muscle in the music industry, and you know, it does trickle down to the independent sector in various ways. But 
if they want a song on, on the radio, they're the guys that are most likely to get it because they're the ones paying for the advertising on the corporate stations. Uh, and not only has music obviously exponentially sort of exploded in Australia as far as bands that can record and release music, the same things happen in the States, of course. And everything in America, you just times it by 100 or whatever. So, you know, there used to be probably more American music than Australian music back in the 70s and 80s when we we're talking. Now, there's, you know, it's the same, it's even more. So there's all of these... Everything's amplified. Everything's except amplified. Except the amount of Australian musicians on played the, on the commercial on the, stations. That's right. It's funny, though, because our our industry and our what we're producing in terms of, of music and acts is be- becoming quite revered around the world. And Absolutely. this Australian flavour is becoming quite revered. Yep. Though you you wouldn't know it if you listened to our own radio outside no. of ABC, Triple J, no. and then community radio stations like that, too. So we've got more music than ever more attention than it's ever had and less receptive radio stations and commercial network generally in your time observing this have you seen a greater commercialization of the product the the, sorry the business of making music sorry of playing music in australia um how have you watched those commercial cogs turn from the 80s to now in terms of how that music is broadcast that's a tricky question (laughs) Uh, I think it's definitely inequ- it's always been inequitable in my opinion you know I think there should have been more Australian bands on commercial radio in the 80s even compared and but but now I agree it's even worse and yes we totally punch above our weight overseas um, I think there's just so many factors one of them is the whole uh, sort of Australian and it's the same in England a little bit there's a tall poppy kind of thing where you, know, you can't be too successful or your yeah. mates don't like you anymore and that's that's a diff, sort of a different thing to what we're talking about with commercial radio um but but one thing to realize is the the, the you know sony universal they're not they're regional offices for a multinational company based in new york or wherever it may be based so that regional office is generally sort of under the auspices of the New York guys. And if they've got, you know, half a dozen US acts that suddenly are breaking, that's going to get the priority of even the major label here, regardless of the Australian acts they might have signed. Um, And, you know, they'll give it all lip service. They don't necessarily want, you know, anyone to think that but you know that's just a fact i mean they're a regional office of a multinational company and it's a tiny little market here uh, and there's only so many spots on um on radio and, and with commercial radio you add in the amount of ads that they want to play uh, and if if part of those ads are being paid for by a major record label so i think that happened in the 80s but it's it's more so than ever now and i think it's probably tougher for radio in general to survive as well because they're com- you know radio is competing with spotify right so if someone's paying them for advertising they're going to put that person's song on the radio against someone not pay- and the the whole aussie independent music sector is certainly not paying for advertising on the commercial stations uh, and so it's just become, it's just gone to a, a, high, a greater extreme. And, and I wish it didn't, and I don't have an answer. You know? <laughs> and I don't think it's right, but I, I can sort of see what's going on. And a lot of it's just, some of it's sort of ignorance as well and naivety. It's not that everyone's out there out to not play Australian music. I think a lot of it is awareness because a lot of the way those programmers find out about the what's coming up is they're being hammered by the major label kind of guys of and and yeah sure they're going to have say six australian releases on the roster that week and 60 us releases and you know it's it's a hard equation i think some of the positives though now which i look to is two of the, the top male and the top female in the world you could probably argue is ed sheeran and taylor swift they're both songwriters. They both play guitars, <laughs> right? So I look to that and go, thank God, you know. 
because if it was Kanye, and I'm sure he's up there, or Beyonce, it's like I'd be worried, more worried about the future than I am. You know what I mean? It's, I think it's fantastic that Ed's there with his guitar and his loop pedal and he's just smashing it out. I've seen him know? perform live and it's like literally just him on a stage. Yeah. So I don't mind him being on the radio <laughs> 10 times a day because it's inspiring young young kids to go, hey, and the same with Taylor. It's like, that's inspiring. I, I guess as well, you know, you said that commercial radio don't have time necessarily I, to I think, play yeah, because of all the advertising, but instead of playing Ed Sheeran 10 times a day, play five times a day and use and, those other five oh, slots to I play. Can, I totally yeah, agree. You I know, totally, you're more Australian I totally agree. And I think, I think there's a, there is responsibility to the majors to because they're the only ones that could really push that. And, mm. and I think they should be doing more along those lines, definitely. And they always should have, you know, because um, it really started... It started in the 90s, the, what, the decline. And really, at the end of the day, Silverchair... I think they went from Triple J, then they broke in the US, and then then it was cool for them to be played on commercial radio in Australia. That, that's yeah. what we've found you know as mean? well. And Crowded House, much the same, you know? But you look at... It's like, oh, the rest of the world thinks it's good. Hang, we better take a look at this band, you know? And then, then it's, it's much easier for the major label too to go, hey, you should be playing this because, you know, 99X and Seattle and K-Rock are playing it in yeah. the States. And I wonder suddenly we- they're like, oh... I wonder so, which way that works more. Is it a we don't think it's good enough until the US say it's good enough? Or is it, you know, the labels I think can the commercial, then say... I think the commercial stations tend to think that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because it's a bit um, of a cultural thing. You mentioned the tall poppy syndrome before. I think yeah. Tones and I was a bit of a victim of that because everyone was going, oh, how good is this? She used to busk in Byron Bay. Now she's, you know, getting played on Triple J, national recognition. How good? And then Dance Monkey came out and then it became, just blew up mm-hmm. everywhere. Mm-hmm. And then everyone's like, oh, Tones and I. Yeah, well, that's the tall poppy <laughs> thing, poppy thing for sure. Or, oh, she's sold out. I've, I heard her on commercial radio. And it, so, it's it's like, so is the lack of Aussie artists on commercial radio potentially cultural within Australian music? You know, people who are hardcore Aussie music lovers think commercial radio is rubbish. So if you get played on commercial radio, therefore you are rubbish. That's part, It's part of it. It's like I was saying, it's, it's never one thing. You know, unfortunately, you know, I wish you wish it was all black and white, and there's that's the run reason. Let's fix that one thing. But it's it's there's probably like a hundred reasons that there's this problem. You know, and it's it's a complex thing. Um, even down to you know, I, and I definitely can't believe this that the AFL, which is an Australian sport, would have an American band play at the grand final consistently like, too. Yeah, like, consistently. Like does does that you know? That, that makes no... I mean, they put Barnsey on. Barnsey's, you know, he's the Aussie icon, what, even though he's not Australian either. But, you know, if they're going to pay for Kiss, it's like... So that... That's something that... And I've got yeah. no answer. I just can't understand that. I'm like, that totally does my head in. It's like, who who are these people that think that there's not a good enough Australian act that can do that and play to Australian punters? Like, Paul Kelly could do that. You know? Well, even on to your ignorance point before, I remember Gang of Views played at the NRL Grand Final. Mm-hmm. They're a perfect, you know, sort of Australian emerging band, even sure. though I think they're well emerged now. But I think they were a perfect band to sort of be on that platform. They very much fit the Triple M sound, which is a lot of what NRL listeners, sure. NRL watchers listen to Triple M because they, they rock the footy and yep. they play, they broadcast all the games on radio. They got announced as the musical act for the NRL Grand Final, and all the comments I was reading going, "Who are these guys? Who are these? Why not get Jimmy Barnes and Cold Chisel or you know all these people?" And it's mm. like these guys actually—if you gave them a chance, or if you just listened to their music, they would be perfect. Well, you know, maybe good, we are the problem. <laughs> but, uh, and, but you know, good on the NRL for doing that. You know, one hundred percent. But I, they, mean, I don't think they've done it since. Because who the gurus? We've we've done it a few times. The NRL, we've done Rugby Sevens. I don't think we've... We may have done something for the AFL, I don't remember. Uh, Ice House probably have. Barnsley definitely would have over over time. I saw Green Spoon at a State of Origin performance yeah, sure. years ago. Yeah, So it's not as if there's not Australian acts that yeah. are just perfect for that, you know. 
but and they just don't get the chance. Yeah. And, and what about from a from a like government perspective? You said you were on the advisory <laughs> group. That, <laughs> I hope we can go there. Yeah. That, that that was chatting about these quotas, and that's all part we're of legislation and absolutely. regulation. And you know, what, for better or worse, we've got legislation and regulation that does dictate what happens in this space. Yes. How have you seen that evolve or devolve over time? <laughs> I don't think a lot has changed. There's a new, um, the Australian Association of Music Managers who are really prominent. It's gone on to become that prominent managers like Bill Cullen, who looks after, you know, Paul Kelly, um, Kate Miller Heinke, Ballpark Music, and you've got John Watson, who's been doing um, the oils, even though they've stopped now, but he also does Cold Chisel and uh, John Butler. And so that level of managers, the top guys basically, are all members of that thing and that grew out of the one I was chairing um, and you know we did a couple of trips down to Canberra and got a lot of lip service from the government I think that it was all everything's great guys you know but then nothing really changed um, and not only were we we were there was a number of things we were fighting for um, and one of them was that every international act that comes out should have an Australian band supporting it you know and that's I'm pretty sure that's that that was in place for there a while, but it's er- eroded now, as far as I can see. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if it is still legislated, but certainly a lot of the when I see international acts coming over, if there's you know if they have two supports, the first one's typically an Australian, yeah. then they bring over an American. It, that's and right. Then, it's still in place, them. but if they only have two, you know, there's still times where the support, Aussie band isn't yeah. in there, and that. That was not the case back in the day. Mm. Um, it had to always be having an Australian in there. Um, and I forget the other things we were trying to fix. Feels like there's more things to fix <coughs> now than perhaps there were then. Yeah, I think so. It's become more complicated, mm. definitely. But um, we, we are so lucky in Australia that um, there's some really good people that have you know, a lot of, I guess, international experience, not just from the bands, but from the management and the crewing point of view as well, where, um, you know, we really punch above our weight overseas. And I think there's there's probably more respect for Australian artists overseas than there is in Australia in a lot of cases. Um, so one thing that never used to happen that I see now, which is fantastic, is a band like Little Quirks, if they were a band, in Australian band in the 80s, they would not have had the shot of going overseas and doing so well at such a young age and at such a point in their career. They would have had to do the hard yards here, or the pubs or whatever you want to call it, before they'd have any possibility of what they've just, you know, I think they've done a couple of really successful kind of festival tours around Europe and, and the US. Um, so that's really opened up, I think, for young artists that, you know, can duck and weave enough to, to get over there. And then the other thing that happens then is they realise how really, sadly in a way, how small the market is here and how much potential they have in those overseas markets. And that's across a lot of genres. I mean, like metal bands that we've recorded on and off over the years, not a lot, but, you know, the few that we have, they all talk about, oh, you know, we've been in Germany for the last six months playing to, you know, 10,000 people a night. Mm. You know, and they just go and live there for six months because that's where their market is, and they're absolutely they're huge there, and no one's ever heard of them here, mm. um, because the market here is so small. It can, you know, you've got Triple J, and that kind of denotes so much, and they've only got so many slots on their playlist. Yeah, um, and so the acts they get overseas, and a, a heavy metal band suddenly they're on all the heavy metal radio stations that only play heavy metal, <laughs> you know, in Europe, and that that doesn't exist here. Yeah. Um, it's just one specific show once a week on Triple J or whatever it is, you know. Um, so, and that never used to happen, you know. The, the internet um, and digi- the digital revolution, if you like, has allowed that to happen. And you know, you can you can apply to set up a tour and a festival run from your computer, sitting in in Sydney or wherever it may be, and jump on a plane and go and do it. You know, that never used to happen. So. I think for the new acts coming through, there's certainly on the live side, there's way more opportunity than than there ever was. Um, and I think the radio thing is a problem and I, I don't know what the fix is, but it's radio is probably not as crucial to a band's success as it used to be. 
So maybe it's balanced a little bit by that. Access is certainly easier now. And I mean, you speak of the little quirks there. They're one example of a, a fantastic success out of the Central Coast. Mm. You've lived here now for about two decades. Mm-hmm. What have you seen in terms of how the scene here has evolved? I mean, it was good enough for Damien Gerard to move here in the first place. We've got studios also like The Grove, yep. the New Sonora Studios up in Tugger as well. So we've got a lot of studios, we've got a lot of bands. Yep. We're getting the venues now. How have you kind of watched it all evolve? Oh, uh, I'd say exponentially. Um, I mean, even where I live down in Woiwoi, I mean, there's the Lincoln Pin now, which you wouldn't believe how it works, but it works. It's this cool little, you think it's just a cafe, and by the time you walk through, it's this fantastic beer garden out the back with a stage, and it's just it's just like walking into a venue in the 80s. It's posters everywhere, and the Ramones are playing. <laughs> it's some sort of time warp. And all the little punk bands, like, you know, Lion Island, those kind of bands. Um, Pilot well, Buffalo have played of there, I course, think, you know, yeah. All those punky, you know, vibey, they're all down in the Lincoln pin and pulling, you know, full house. Uh, and then, you know, Drifter's Wharf now, that's become, you know, finally, you know, it's a decent room on the coast. It's all been acoustically redone. And um, in the old days, you know, live touring, you know, we'd come up to the coast and you'd play at the at the leagues clubs and stuff. You know, of course, that doesn't happen anymore with the pokies, except for entrance leagues where... Huda Guru is applying next week. Um, but I've seen not only, I think, the venues and the studios have been an organic kind of thing that's increased due to the amount of artists living here now. I mean, my generation, I was down in Sydney on Sunday at a studio down there at a bit of an event, and we were all talking about how many old bandmates have now moved to the coast because for whatever reason, you know, Sydney's too expensive now or they've got work up here, whatever. It's it's become a destination for, for musicians, without a doubt. It was always, it always had the country people, even since I think the 80s, you know, everyone knew that, you know, Casey Chambers was up on the coast or, and Shane Nicholson's been here a long time and Becky Coles and so that, that was... It was sort of known as, oh, that's that's where all the country guys are. And, of course, Rod McCormack had his studio. I think that's still going. And they just mm-hmm. did all the country people. And Jeff played in all the bands, you know, um, the McCormack brothers. So it, it was known for that to start with. And then the other thing I think that really helped um, get the scene going here was Brian Lazotte, you know, because his first Lazotte's was King Cumber. And he just had Kim, King Cumber for years and years. And because he was properly in the music scene and knew everyone because he started out as, as a as a caterer at, at huge for huge acts so he catered dire straits at the entertainment center and stuff so all the record labels knew him all the promoters knew him so they were confident that if they sent their act up to Lazotte's, even though it was this tiny little thing that was like unplugged they'd get looked after and it would be worthwhile so that's what really put that on the map and that really helped to put the coast on the map musically um, and because there was international acts playing there as well, and then, then he he owns the um, owns the building that the Newcastle one's in now. So that's why he's consolidated it back to there. So he had to kind of move north because he couldn't stay at King Cumber any longer. The old greedy landlord story, which we all know about. <laughs> that old chestnut. Um, but that was another big tick, I think, for the coast that the live music scene it really benefited from those probably a good 10 years i think that that ran and even the local musicians too like winterbourne like we're not just mentioning people who've been here for homebrew studio sure. sessions yeah. but <laughs> watch the videos though <laughs> but that's right winterbourne one of their first gigs was at lazotte's exactly. at king Cumber because that was the place to go when yep. i know that you know a lot of schools had performances there and they were very big on getting musicians their start and performing to an audience and from there obviously we know how you know, Winterbourne have just grown from there. They've done sold out shows in Sydney and obviously they did quite well at Drifters Wharf not too long ago as well. So, you know, they're an example of what happens when you have venues like Lazotte's and Lincoln Pin and Woi Woi who are giving these young bands a shot. Yeah, it, it just it just makes a, a huge difference, you know, if they don't have to travel a long way to, to put on a show. Um, and it, it's also... Bands always start playing to their friends and family. That's how a, a, a young band begins. And, you know, if there's a venue where they live and work and where their families are, they're going to go and see them. You know, if they've got to travel 100 kilometres up to Newcastle or down to Sydney to, yeah. to do a gig, 
they're going to be playing to no one when they start. Yeah. You know? So it's it's a really key element in the whole music scene developing. And I think that, you know the Central Council, Coast Council, you know they they did their music festival thing last year. And they're doing it again this year, I believe. So you know they're getting behind it as well, yeah. which you certainly don't see any councils in Sydney doing to, to that level. You know. And, um, you know, they've also done more support with the Herd Community Project, which, yep. you know, Pilot Buffalo were a part of. Yep. Uh, Neve was a part of that as well, and that was all done here at Damien Gerard as well. So that sort of went at the top when I said that you're helping, you know, support, you know, the whole industry here on the coast. It, it comes right down to to that. And, you know, if anyone does come here to record as when Amy and I first walked in, we'd never been to a recording studio. And we're right. like, oh, this is pretty cool. You know, we felt <laughs> like, I guess, what a new band would. Yeah. And we walked in and we're going, this is a really cool space. And we've, you know, since been to a few more. But there's, you know, something really cool about this room and this backdrop. And, you know, it, any, yeah, as I said, any artist who comes through will probably get that little giddy feeling in them about yeah. you know, the space that this is and the history as we've touched on as a- well. Absolutely. And, I mean, traditionally too, uh, you know, studios and venues and I guess rehearsal rooms as well they all kind of go together they're all you know we you know we a studio needs some live venues so the bands can go out and play live and fuel the crowd and earn some money so they can afford to record it's it's like a whole um you know synergy between between them um so studios are often found you know near places that have got some venues and, and a scene um you know, even if you go overseas, you know, somewhere like Austin, Texas is, is just the most perfect example. There's tons of studios, tons of venues, tons of musicians living there because it's, it's all there. Nashville's even bigger in that respect, you know. It's streets full of studios and you can be a, a session musician there and that's, that's, all you, that's your livelihood and you walk up and down the street and play your guitar all day, you know. And that's a, that's a lot of musicians' dream, you know. Um, so they feed off, it all feeds off each other. Um, and it also means that because of all that cross-pollination between, you know, say the, the experience we've got here from being in Sydney and we've brought all that to the coast and then a, a young band's going to get that, all that experience, you know, in, in their recording. And then, you know, we know that, we, I know Mark that runs the Lincoln Pin, you know, and um, Murray's always down at Drifters Wharf hanging out with his mates. So, you know... When we had the open day, someone piped up and said, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm young, I don't know how to get a gig. And, you know, Neve straight away went, oh, well, you, you get onto this website and that website and, um, you know, do you know about the link? You know, and everyone sort of, it's a very collaborative scene, in, especially early on. You know, everyone wants to see young acts doing well. I don't think older bands look at that as competition. They look at it as, you know, it's healthy, you know, because it means the, the live music scene the recording scene can all you know flourish and continue on it's just so and so it's a it's a good real nurturing feeling i think with older musicians and people like us too wanting to nurture the younger talent coming through because you want to see them succeed and you don't want to see them not be able to get get a gig and they have to you know do do something just on their computer and you know it, it, live is all about connecting with people and i think releasing music is also about creating that connection. You, you want to, a, a good song should have an emotional connection to somebody. And stuck at home, you know, on a computer, it's not necessarily going to translate in the, in the way it does, you know, recording properly or just doing a gig in front of people. Yeah, definitely makes for some special recordings uh, within these walls. Um, you mentioned to us earlier that, that 2019 is when Damien Gerard came about to the Central Coast. Then we obviously had COVID. And you said before, I don't know if this was um, off camera or, or, or whatever, but that that you've only had your open day a couple of weeks back. So yeah. we're in 2023. So you're almost playing this catch up with the, with totally the studio are. in terms of how how that vision would have been when you first opened. So w- what what is it that, I mean, apart from what you're providing and what everyone can see, what is it that you want this studio to achieve in five years, provided there isn't another gigantic global pandemic? Uh, a lot of, well, well, one thing we're, we're going to start from next year is doing some um which i've seen a studio that we're friends with in in nashville uh do they do um they do camps so they'll do like four days of just analog recording techniques Uh, they'll do four days of um you know producing and songwriting they'll do four days of um mixing so we want to and that's something we've never really done 
as far we've done the odd master class you know one day sort of thing but we've never done the whole four day camp thing and so we want to start building that in next year and the other um, thing that we've now got the opportunity to do which we did a little bit of in Belmain but it was a much smaller live room because you, know, you can see how big this place is we can we've got a PA we've got foldback we can put an audience in here so part of the part of what we talked about in 2019 was putting on you know a networking event as a little live gig in here you know once a month and of course COVID killed that as well so and that would be a whole you know a networking and a, and a mentoring event where you know you could have a, a a guest artist, maybe there's a bit of an open mic vibe. Uh, someone like, um, you know, Jake Gazar back in the day, he offered to be an MC, you know, and sort of host the night. And we could have different guest hosts even. Um, so adding that other element that, which I'm come from live anyway, uh, which the other studios aren't necessarily set up to do, but because of this great room and, the, you know, the car park, it's kind of set up that it could be a little mini mini sort of event place as well potentially some ticketed events with um you know really uh we've got famous session musers on the coast now like evan Manell lives on the coast i mean he's played with you know paul kelly angus and julia um he flew got flown to london to do some royal command performance for somebody <laughs> the other the other week you know um, we've got people at that level that are pretty much international level players um, you know, he's at the level where, you know, someone like um, Rodriguez comes out to Australia back when he was alive and he used to do this. He'd want to pick up, he'd get a pickup band that would learn the songs and he'd just front up and the Aussies would be his backing band and Evan's at that level where he'd, he would do that. So we can get someone like him in and there's a fantastic jazz drummer on the coast, Toby Hall, who's one of the teachers at Grammar as well. So we could do, you know, fantastic, you know, masterclass just for drummers, just with literally with those two guys their sort of knowledge and everything so branching out from just doing recording and trying to have a I guess a more holistic sort of plan of you know all these different aspects to it that, that add in and really help to just creating experiences for people you know that's I think that's where it's got to go too because everyone's just wedded to their screens you know their phones so much nowadays but there's nothing like face to face especially post covid i think a lot of people did realize what we were missing you know so having you know proper human networking interaction and mentoring and actual people talking about whatever technique it may be rather than someone watching the same thing with some american artists doing it which there's plenty of it of course it's all over youtube you know how to do this how to do that but i want to do it for real in here you know yes it's providing a, a like you said a holistic approach to to offers for for what this yeah. indigenous music scene yeah. can have yeah and, and you know in educating i think especially the younger artists there's so much mis misinformation online which you know we never had to deal with when we were young but they can so get the wrong idea about even things like copyright and um how that works and apra and um you know, all the really keystones of being a musician and an artist and particularly being a songwriter. Um, there's really certain specific things that, that it's good to know and good to know that, yes, this is this is legit and this is the right thing. That one over there, no, <laughs> you know. And, and, it's really, and when you don't know, you don't know. It's really hard to tell. It all looks nice and shiny online um, and there's a lot of realities in there that... Um, the young ones aren't necessarily going to be able to find out unless someone who knows can can explain it to them so having nights like that you know where they can ask questions and get actually real answers from people in the industry that can can help them out well marshall thanks so much for for having us today here at damien drive studios in west gosford thanks for being i guess the the homebrew studio sessions studio yeah you, we love you, it you we will, love it. Like, the home the, homebrew home base yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely it feels like we're in a second home yeah. the studio we've spent the most time at apart from the coast of studios Definitely. i think so oh, yeah. it's, it's great it's, great it's awesome to be here. great to chat to you and pick your brain you know you've got years of experience in yeah. the industry so if people do want to come here and check it out or you know lay down a a base or get a recording done mm -hmm. here what's the best place what's the best contact Just head to the website damiengerard.com.au and it's D-A-M-I-E-N, <laughs> G-E-R-A-R-D. And there's lots of great information on there. And it's my phone number's on there. It's quite open about that. Anyone can call me and we can have a chat.
Easy. Very, very accommodating. We can vouch for that. So, Marshall, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you soon. Great. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>